Welcome to iPad Pros, the show all about being productive and having fun. I'm Tim Chen, host of the show. Came out that I wanted to do story mode as the game, but I'd love to put the battle game out. So much of the code base originally was there to make sure that the game would work as a single player game and as a battle game. If you look at the single player game like a game of golf, where you're just traveling out on this wide field, the battle game is more like basketball, where you're on this arena, you can play up to six players at once, and you're all one at a time going into levels. And the levels that you play, your opponents can't walk on. It kind of becomes this game of tic-tac-toe, and in the levels you'll find power-ups, and then you can apply those power-ups, which are good and bad, onto your next levels or your opponent's levels. Interrupting the regular two-week schedule of iPad Pros is this very special interview with Steve Demeter, the creator and developer of the 2008 hit iPhone game Trism and the recently released iPad and iPhone game Trism 2. We discuss a wide range of topics, including the early days of iPhone development and the App Store, game design, the creation of Trism 2, and much more. Whether you play games or not, I believe this interview provides a fascinating insight into the process of creation and hope everyone enjoys this very special extra episode of iPad Pros. Without further ado, here's my interview with Steve. Enjoy. I'm here today with Steve Demeter, a creator of Trism and Trism 2. Welcome to the podcast. Uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me. Appreciate being here. Thanks for being on. It's a great honor to have you on the podcast. Uh, back when the iPhone came out, Trism was one of the very first games that was put on my phone, and it's still on there today. So that says a lot about the, just the quality of the game you created. Thanks so much. It's it's uh, seen its share of updates over the years, but appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, can you introduce who you, who you are and kind of what role the iPad plays in your life? Sure. Steve Demeter, I'm an entrepreneur, gamer, aficionado, iPad. I've always kind of had one, you know, lying around a house somewhere somewhere. Since they came out, really, I think 2011, I have it with me whenever I travel. I used to carry a laptop with me all the time. That seemed to be replaced by the iPad. Gaming, of course, watching movies, all that kind of stuff. Great. And can you introduce as well what Trism and Trism 2 are? Sure. Trism, it's a portmanteau of Triple Smash came out at the launch of the App Store July 10th, 2008. It was there at launch day of the App Store. It was one of the first 151 games available. I made this just in my spare time as a kind of a hobbyist game. I took after the kind of, you know, puzzle games of the day, like Bejeweled. This was before the whole casual game market existed. There was no Candy Crush. Phone games were nascent. You you had just a couple on Windows Mobile, and that was it. So I somehow landed at just the right moment to you know ride this wave of actual full fledged gaming on these uh, mobile devices. And Trism Two is you know the return. It's a sequel. It's been something I've worked on on and off for a couple of years now, and. I felt, why not put it out at the 10th anniversary to the day? So July 10, 2018, uh, Trism 2 came out. Awesome. Yeah, that was a nice surprise when I saw on, on Twitter that hit. It's like, oh, this, this, is, this is great. And it, it has an iPad kind of interface for it as well. Uh, the original yeah, one, yeah. of course, since it came out in 2008, uh, the iPad was not around. Sure. And Trism was uh, kind of a wild hit. What was your life like before Trism was out? I was working at Wells Fargo. I was a software engineer there, architect. I've been in engineering since college, really. I, I think I was one of those people that grew up with Nintendo. That was my childhood, really. I was, you know, in the basement playing those games for years. And all my friends were into it. And it's kind of what you did. You know, if you don't play basketball or baseball, you're, you, you're on your, you're in your games. I wanted to really give back to the community. I really wanted to express and art, if you will, you know, create. I found it was kind of prohibitive to do that there were really only a couple different avenues you could make a game on pc or make a game for it said windows mobile but the ecosystem was not there you couldn't get a game out so with the iphone i really found a like i said i just hit the ball to the park with the sales channel yeah and if memory is correct there was a jailbreak version even before the app store was around how was it experimenting with developing before it was official if you really want to get into this i mean i had been doing gray hat stuff for a while. My company, Demiforce, started out as a ROM hacking and localization group over the internet. We would take old games 
like the, the Final Fantasy 2, and I think the most popular one was Mother 3. Oh, yes, that classic yeah. GBA game. Yeah. Never, yeah, never was, made it to the States, for those that yeah, don't know. That's it. It's, it's games that were never brought over. We would take those and translate them into English, and you'd have to go into the ROM, which is just, you know, it's compiled, so it's hex. It's just binary. You would extract a script, create tools to translate that script into English, and you know, put the professionals on it, reinsert it, and then rewire the font rendering functions in, you know, machine language. Again, just, just hex, so that it plays as though it's in English. I don't have a degree in computer science. I have a degree in Japanese. I kind of learned programming in reverse. I learned first how to do it in hex, and then eventually <laughs> try to put words to it. Wow. Um, yeah. So I kind of got the wrong education up front, but you know, it's just kind of goober I am. Yeah, of interest to you, there's actually a developer that figured out how to, uh, within Swift Playgrounds, create an NES emulator. So you can now nice. officially, yeah, officially <laughs> through Swift Playgrounds, you can actually, I've got Mario running on my iPad with keyboard, awesome. keyboard shortcuts to control it. It's great. Yeah, man. Well, it's just the kind of stuff that I love. I love just, you know, getting into firmwares and just figuring stuff out and trying to go somewhere that nobody's been before. It expressed itself at this current point in time where I, you know, saw the iPhone and, I think we all remember that first year the iPhone was out. Everybody thought it was so cool. But, you know, Steve Jobs famously went on stage and said, well, you don't need apps for this thing. You don't need access to the firmware. You can create web apps, right? You yeah, sweet, enough, sweet right? solution, right? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Steve. Yeah. No, I'm just like, no, come on. We got to make real games for this thing. So I just went around at the first iPhone dev camp. My buddy Dom Sagola runs it. And I just found some people that were working on would eventually be the first jailbreak software and i just downloaded the tool chain and got to work and i had like a sprite up and going the first night once you have that once you have like a hello world you're golden because then it's just rinse and repeat yeah you know create more sprites and gaming logic and then everything but the hard part is just getting there yeah and so i wrote that in notepad you know put it out and yeah it was it was my little game so coming from not a development background what was the learning process like if you find problems and kind of google solutions or how do you learn there's no ide there's no there's no intellisense it crashes it doesn't work yeah it's not public but i was used to that mm -hmm. that's the fun stuff you can drive a car 100 miles an hour if you want to but people still race on foot or race on on horseback why you know it's it's because they want the challenge yeah i uh, understand now game developers You'd seem to have to wear a lot of hats. You know, the back-end code that runs the game, the art assets, the sound effects, music. Was Trism all yourself, uh, you know, designing it and music and all that? It wasn't that big of a game. I kind of got away with it, doing most of it, but I had help. You know, I had some people that were very dear to me and helped out. Robert Suarez helped out with game design. We had a guy to do the the art for the syllogism levels. I can't remember what his name was. I think he's in the credits. I've, I haven't talked to him since, though. I was the one working on it day and night. You know, I don't want to take credit, but it was... Right, yeah, no. Yeah, was, I was the one slaving over it. And it really is a polished product. The, the sound design especially is fantastic. Uh, just the you. sensation you get from getting a, a trism and do, uh, do the chains and the, the sound changing and yeah, it's... it's Yeah, and the locking me mechanism. It's just, yeah, yeah. Uh, fantastic. Now, the early days of the App Store, what was that like? Uh, there weren't, as I'd imagine, as much analytics knowing how your app was doing. And what was that whole experience like at the very beginning? Yeah, I don't think anybody realized like what it was going to be. Apple did a Motorola phone some years back before the iPhone. And people were like, yeah, okay. You had John Dot and Brew on Blackberries and things. And people were like, okay, there's like a game there and two. And I think that's kind of the expectation people thought the iPhone was going to have when it came out. But it being basically better than current generation handhelds at the time made it so that it proved out its business case in a number of ways. And people just started scrambling. Like, I think people started getting the word it was going to be something, but it didn't really hit until that, I think, that first day. There's no analytics. I mean, you, you couldn't. I think Flurry came out shortly thereafter. I ran my own event-driven analytics in the back end. I didn't really know how big it was going to be. I, I knew I had fans. I knew I had the goodwill of the people around me, and that was enough. But it's hard to kind of differentiate between a thousand and a million people behind you, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yeah. Like, I, I knew it was something, but I just 
until you see them in, in real life, you can't tell. You know, you feel a sense of being surrounded by that love. And it just kind of pushed me to do it. In the days and weeks and months that, that followed since the launch, it was like, okay, things are getting serious. Like my app survived in the top 10 for, I think, a couple of months. But there very quickly came advertising campaigns and people trying to figure it out and ASO and all this stuff. And I remember the guys that made the Bejeweled app for the App Store. They came and congratulated me because I was meeting them. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know how I did this. I mean, that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> and then like the next day, like they were above me. And I don't think I ever recovered from that. I think they definitely had like the corporate angle on that advertisement strategy. And I'm just like, that's cool. Like I, I'm just a guy i don't i don't <laughs> i mean maybe if i hired a team yeah yeah, yeah. it's hard to, to beat the big names you know you, people search for tetris or something and, you know yeah <sighs> yeah and i think the word beat is probably the key word there i wasn't really out to beat anybody for me it was art it was i just wanted to make people happy and looking back on this should i have probably tuned up that fire inside my belly a bit more and, and wanted to win perhaps i mean would it have made me a billionaire possibly i don't know I, I was too concerned with just letting people enjoy it the company itself came second yeah now nintendo and miyamoto will often say the the controller will inspire creativity like the joystick in mario 64 uh things like that did the uh, form factor of the iPhone and the cell ROM and different things impact the idea of Tourism and its design? Yeah, of course. I mean, I think they're not wrong by saying that. I think that's a very astute thing to say. But that's not to say that any other type of control is also viable. It's just you have to figure out how to do it, right? These games that are on these phones now, for years, people were like, oh my god, there's no keyboard, right? There are no physical controllers. What are we going to do? And you sell <laughs> these weird attachments trying to there's still companies out today trying to put attachments oh, yeah, on the yeah. iPhone. It's ridiculous. For D pads and things. And I love my Brawl Stars, you know, and Brawl Stars is a very arcade kind of game. You can't expect to bolt that into a form factor that doesn't natively gear towards it. So you get different games. You get your endless runner games where it's just a button. You touch the whole screen and it's that's the button, right? But that right. works. Yeah. And th there's nothing that says that that game, that kind of game, is any less than the kind of game you would see on a console with a D-pad, right? Because it's just, the games will diverge and they'll go different ways based on what's the natural, logical end to that design given the constraints. And for controlling the original Trism, the cellarometer was just a, a very intuitive way to, to tell where the blocks are going to fall. Yeah, thank you. When I saw just how that works, it's like, wow, that, that's great. What in Trism 2 made that idea not make sense for the sequel? There's a couple different ways I want to answer this because the fans are are mixed yeah interesting too with that it is a different experience it's it's they're both great yeah. but yeah it is a different experience first i want to address the different experience bit yes trism 2 is very different you don't wait for something for a decade and expect the same thing do you no i mean i wouldn't want it it's like i've got the original trism if i want that i want something new. i mean if that's what you're expecting i don't know what to tell you <laughs> what i noticed is that apps in the early days of the app store featured the accelerometer pretty heavily because of the fact that it was new right oh my god it's it's the accelerometer it's multi-touch it's it's the camera it's everything all this stuff we don't have before and i somehow stumbled upon a way to ride that wave very very well right mm -hmm. yeah i had a game which featured this accelerometer in an intuitive way and people were like oh my god it, it's a killer app does that need to be there for every game that's the question i wanted to pose because as games have gone forward, and not that I'm taking cues from other games, accelerometer stuff, it, it's fallen off. I mean, you, you certainly have games like the the jumping games and things that are accelerometer-based. Yeah, driving is, uh, the, the racing games yeah. are probably the biggest example still today, yeah. I'd say. Yeah. And it's great, because you want the full screen there. You know, you want the control experience not to be inhibited by your touches, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. For Truism 2, I had accelerometer-based gameplay there for years. I think it's up, up until like 2016. And it works. The code's still there. Right? You can you can control it if you want to. Or, I mean, if I turn that code right on. <laughs> what I wanted to do with this one was free it from that. Because a lot of times I've, I've found myself just twisting and turning the device like in areas where it wasn't really appropriate. Like from the subway, I'm like hitting something with my shoulder. At what point does this feature become a gimmick, which is just kind of inhibiting more than expressing? An iPad, it would make not much sense at all either yeah that too the ipad is, is unwieldy and by the way you can 
tilt the game. I'm not, I'm not sure if you're far enough to have unlocked this yet, but in the second act of Jade Island, you get a compass, and the compass allows you to rotate the board. Okay. Yeah, I've not quite hit yeah. that at this point. Yeah, hit that. That's, that's okay. <laughs> kind of where it opens up. But yeah. I wanted a bit of time to go forward before I unlock that for the player because I wanted them to get used to what the game really is in terms of the core gameplay before they can really add that layer of, of game. Because honestly, Trism 1, it's it's I like it, but I think it's too much. You're thrown right in, and it could be confusing if you don't spend enough time to, to learn the mechanics. Well, I think people were interested in learning the, in the first case because it was a hit, and it was a, it was a killer app, and people were drawn into it. But I think in these days where players are a lot more reluctant, if you hit them over the head with so many new things, they're just going to walk away. Yeah, and there is a good pace of unlocking the mechanics and it teaching you. Sure. The original Mario, first you learn the jump and then you learn the run. Sure. And yeah, it's, sure. it's slow progression, which is good. If you want to get like strategic, the real benefit to a controlling direction via swipe is whenever you touch outside the boundaries of the board, you can start rotating the lattice of the board. As long as you're doing this, the board stands still. So if you're like mid-chain, you can do this and it'll stop the action and you can change the way they drop mid-fall. So it becomes very strategic. You can pause the gameplay oh. and get 12 chains, 20 chains, 30 chains that way. Yeah. And you can't do this with the accelerometer. People are trying to do this. No, yeah. And I would I... see people just like <laughs> shaking the phone and I wanted to address that. So that's that's the reason. Yeah, I think I've got maybe nine or ten at my most for a chain in the original one, but <laughs> it's a lot of work to try to figure out where they're falling and hitting that. The thing I found about Tristan One is it was good, but it was a slot machine. Yeah. You know, you had no idea whenever you hit a billion points. And people love that. People love slot machines. And I was oh, like, sure. that's great. I that's cool. But it's not the game I wanted to make. And I only had so many months to do it. And I said, Okay, I've made Tristan One. Let me go back and make a good game for Tristan Two. And say what you want about the whole adventure and the character and the hero and everything. But just in terms of the core gameplay, I think I've done a quantum leap here. Like, I, I'm really proud of the gameplay. Where the bonus works and the tapping and then the rotation. That's the expression of game I wanted to put out back in 08. I, I just didn't have time to do it. I feel like having sat on this for 10 years, I have very mixed feelings about this. Because I've wanted the fans to be able to play it like this for so long. Yeah. But we can talk about that. Let's... <laughs> yeah, no, I do. And I do like the updates with there's there's enemies on the board that you need to kill and you have life and all that. Like there are nice new mechanics I've been enjoying so far, even in the early stages of it. Thank you. Thank you. With the original Trism now 10 years old, I noticed there was an update recently to be 64 bit. How much work was it to do that? Oh, it's not hard. It's, it's just, it wasn't. Okay. It's just changing <laughs> ins to NS Integer. It's just your standard stuff. You know, they have libraries that deprecate, but you get used to it. It's the Apple way. Yeah, so many old games fell off, and I was glad to see Trism survive. Screen size would be the harder thing to adjust for, because you have to change how the m m number of rows in your game, things like that, and that's probably something you don't want to, to worry about at this point. I am getting people asking me, Steve, love that you're working on Trism 2, but could you add like iPhone 10 compatibility for Trism 1? And I'm like, I don't know how to do that. Like That's adding rows yeah. to the screen. It was like fundamentally change. <laughs> yeah. It was a game really packed into the form factor of the original iPhone, and I just didn't want to screw with that. It's done. Yeah. The SE is probably the best uh, Trism device at this point. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sound design. What's kind of your philosophy with that? And a lot of users will probably have it muted, and what considerations do you make there? Yeah, I mean, and this is going to come up again and again in this interview. It's that I don't care that people have the sound off. I'm not making the sound for those people. I'm making the sound for people like me. Like, I love the soundtrack to Bejeweled Twist. It's yeah. like, it's genius. And it comes directly from, you know, this guy Skaven. He, he went by the same Skaven back in the old demo scene days. And, like, I can trace the chord progression on those tracks back to, like, the demos they released in 1991. Like, I get so into that kind of stuff. Trism was my love letter to that kind of sound design. I don't listen to Top 40. I listen to the old game soundtracks. Like, that's just the kind of guy <laughs> I am. So it was very important for me to get this stuff right. And it's okay if they mute it. It's fine. There are going to be some people who like it, and I, I made it for them. Your kind words are very much appreciated. Yeah, absolutely. So Trism 2, it's been a work in progress for many years now. How has it changed over the years? What was your original thought, and where did it end up uh, going? I could talk to you for about 
a week for that. <laughs> Trism 2 started out as a side game I called Axism. And what you were going to do was twist a hexagon of Trisms around clockwise, kind of like Bejeweled Twist, like I just said. My idea was always to iterate on the core gameplay. I didn't like the whole slotting bit. I thought the slotting bit was way too much control. I, I was too unwieldy. I wanted a simpler way to get things done. I wanted a gameplay that was easy to learn, hard to master. And I went around for a long while at that. And eventually I found tapping. And tapping really worked for me. And I, I liked it. And I went through different iterations of that. At first it had like a next color, kind of like Tetris, but that was still too hard. You ran out of bases too often. There was a game, I think, called Oro, which had a gameplay similar to what I'm doing here in Tristan 2. The color takes the color of the, the adjacent, the blocks. And I was like, that's it. And then I used the bonus system from Bejeweled Twist. I just baked down about six years for you. <laughs> <laughs> the gameplay. <laughs> the world came from... I've always been a fan of games like Zelda, Final Fantasy, Ease... Any game with real attention put towards story in a genuine way has moved me in my life just as much as comic books or TV or film. And I really wanted to do that. And to me, I thought it was a really cool challenge to put that in a game like this, knowing full well that people don't really do that. But I was like, that's that's my challenge, right? Yeah. And it just so happened that this whole casual game thing arrived around 2010, 2011 with games like Candy Crush. It was like, well, that's cool. That's not really what I'm doing here. However, in the time since then, the casual market's just gone a very different direction into like, you know, microtransactions and whittling down the experience to basically just a rinse and repeat kind of little gotcha mechanic. Yeah. Barely a game. It's like a thin veneer of a game on top of a, a money-making machine. Yeah, they hire people from Vegas to do similar yeah. mind tricks. Yeah. Yeah. It's unfortunate that I made a match three game originally because I have to follow that. People are going to see it and they're going to think it's a Candy Crush clone. And considering the fact that this game got started before Candy Crush was even a thing, you know, you have to wrestle with that. And you have to reckon with that. How am I going to avoid that perception? And the answer I, I always came back to was, well, I have this story and I have these characters and they're really weird. Like, it's a weird story. Do I need to, like, dumb this down? When I was pitching to publishers that always say dumb it down. And I'm like, no, I need it to be weird to differentiate from that. Yeah, it kind of like a little almost earthbound as far as it's just it's bizarre in a good way. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, I take that as a huge compliment. I think earthbound is great. The question was always, is it too weird? No, make it weirder. And then just challenge your audience. And then make them pay for it. Don't offer it free to play. Buck the trend. Don't do the Candy Crush thing. So what if it doesn't sell? I'm okay. I've had that validation. I've had a hit under my belt. I don't need it to do X. I'm fine in my life. I'd rather just put it out as an expression and let them just ponder over it for years. Yeah. And I love that you buy it once. I believe it's three dollars. Is that right? Three bucks. Same as Tristan One. Yeah, it's a fantastic price point. And there's gonna be new content coming, a couple more islands, and those will also just be free updates. Which that's awesome that you're doing that. Thank you. Yeah, no ads, no microtransactions, no subscription, nothing waiting for you, nothing gonna pounce on you. I don't even ask you to rate the thing. You just play it. And it's there. You know, I should have made this for consoles or something or like peace because I'm just I'm finding like this game was really meant to be a love letter to my inspirations. But all my inspirations were on Nintendo. So I'm like, I should have just made this thing for 3DS or something. <laughs> uh, so the narrative, what is the story of Trism 2 for those without too many spoilers? I'm giving out a lot of no's. I'm not going <laughs> to I'm not going to tell you. That. OK, <laughs> by I, the game, I, not, we'll find out. <laughs> Yeah, the story's not complete. You're gonna get some people wanting to know what it is. If I offered any commentary, it, it wouldn't stand on its own. I'll say one thing. I'll say this thing. It is a, uh, a Buddhist story. Okay. I've been a Buddhist now for about 20 years, and it and, and it influences my art pretty heavily. Yeah, that'll be interested in playing with that perspective in mind. Sure. Difficulty is a thing game designers have to deal with. The original Trism just scaled the longer you manage to not die in a session. How did you manage to balance difficulty in this game and making sure people could see the end game content? Well, it's different when you don't have five lives or pay more to get back in the game. When you have unlimited lives without the free to play, you can challenge them more. 
you've bought this thing and you're in it to win it and you're going to go, that's it. So why not make it hard? Some of these levels are punishingly hard. Oh, yeah. I've, uh, I've wrestled with a couple of them already. <laughs> I know I'm early in the game. Yeah. You listen to your fans. I've had this thing in beta test for a while and you hear them and their perspectives. A lot of those are valid. If something is frustrating, then you do something about it. If something is challenging, that's a very different thing. Yeah. And if it's challenging for the right reasons in the right place, then I say no. I, I push back and I'm like, this is the gate and you need to appreciate that gate and do what you need to do to learn. And maybe that means go back. And there's a lot of backtracking you know, suggested or even required in this game. And I think it's a good thing. I think it, it gets you out of that, the headspace of this just being a, a mindless, you know, level one, level two, level three kind of game. So I'm okay with that. Yeah. And I believe there are like side paths of optional levels. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. If you're on Amber Island, the first one, and you don't unlock the treasure chest when the elder gives you the key, you can use that key for a different treasure chest behind the first boss and get a whole different power up that affects the way you play through the entire game. And that's for people who see that chest back there the first time they play it. And they're like, how do I get that? Try this different method and see how it works. Like, that's the kind of game I love playing, you know? Yeah, it reminds me a lot of Zelda finding the mysteries. Yeah, absolutely. I think as a whole, mobile gaming is kind of in a place where we're really not about that. It's it's really about get them to the next opportunity to spend. And that's just not what this game is. And I'm proud for it not to be that. Not that I'm disrespecting those games. I mean, I work in the game industry and that's the kind of game that like I make. So I can't, like, <laughs> you know, it puts food on the table. Yeah. Know? But this as an opportunity to make art, like it's just not that kind of game. Yeah. Just how big is the game? I know two more islands are in development. Like what expectations should players have for, I don't know, Playtime is a thing. I know it's a lot of pick up and set down, but uh, is it a 20 hour game, a 40 hour game? I don't even know how to answer that. Like, notice there's four more islands. There's six islands in, in all. Six islands in all, okay. Yeah. You've got your campaign, you go straight through. You know, you got your gameplay achievements, do all the in level challenges. You got your fetch quests, which there aren't too many of currently, but there will be. I'll, I'll add content back into the existing islands when the new islands come out because you may need to backtrack from ruby island into fluorite island or you might need to backtrack from sapphire island into jade island to fix a quest right yep there's also the challenges of completing all the levels or getting all the stars i can't i don't even know how to answer that like i never i never <laughs> measured up by that yeah when it's all said and done you could spend 100 hours in this game easy yeah i know it's a pretty deep game so i'm just curious about that yeah I know progress syncing happens. I know I just entered my name, Tim, and set a password with that. How does the whole syncing architecture work with the game? We run an AWS stack, ELB, with CloudWatch for security. I got RDS with multi-AZ for replication. It just syncs and persists. It sends data to the server. Whenever you complete a level or warp or get any event, an event means like an achievement or something with the story or what have you. If you're offline, it'll keep trying until you get back online. So if you go on an airplane and you're in airplane mode, it'll persist that the, the second you turn your phone back on when you land. Gotcha. What are you most proud of with the original Trism and now Trism 2? Trism 1, I was most proud of how it opened the door for people. It gave a voice to people where they didn't have any. And certainly I can't take full credit for that because it was the ecosystem that allowed that to happen but i was a case study and i was part of that story i really appreciate being part of that history with the second one i love the fact that this is going to be something that not everybody's going to like finding the balance between artistic expression and business has always been something that's very challenging to me and where do you f find yourself on that fulcrum and you know give myself the permission to make a weird game and have a story where people are like, what is this? I'm expecting some little casual thing and challenging them. I'm most proud of that journey that's led me here. Yeah. Now, something I'm curious about, with the original Trism, could you see yourself building that into Trism 2 as like an unlockable content after you beat the game as a way to uh, only have to maintain one set of code base kind of going forward? Or Do you mean like an endless mode, like infinism? Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, you got to understand, like, I cut this game back considerably. I put a lot of work into it, 
back from 2011 to 2014. And then I put it on ice when I had to go get a job because I ran out of money. I've only recently come back to it this past year to finish it up. It was essentially four modes. The story mode was just the first mode. Another one was a battle mode, which was, you could kind of compare it to like Clash Royale meets Wars with Friends. Third mode was like a daily challenge mode Mm -hmm. where you do a different level and it's different every day. And if you beat it, you get like, you know, your name on the board or whatever. And then the fourth one is like a Zen mode. There's no points. It's just nice, pretty skies and no enemies and go as long as you can, as long as you want. And there's nice, like ambient music. Yeah. Again, it's all there. It's just, how do I release that? Right. And I had to say to myself, A, you know, when I picked this back up to release it for the 10 year launch, I was like, what makes the most sense product wise? Because having this much in a game is going to confuse people. And two, what's the right amount I can debug and get really solid for launch? And it came out that I wanted to do story mode as the game, but I'd love to put the battle game out. Like, yeah. it, like so much of the code base originally was there to make sure that the game would work as a single player game and as a battle game. Like if you, if you look at the single player game, like a game of golf where you're mm-hmm. just, you know, traveling out on this, on this wide field, the battle game is more like basketball huh. where you're on this arena and you have, you can play up to six players at once and you're all one at a time going into levels and the levels that you play, your opponents can't walk on. It kind of becomes this game of tic-tac-toe. And in the levels, you'll find power-ups, and then you can apply those power-ups, which are good and bad, onto like your next levels or your opponent's levels. So you can kind of snake them into playing a level that you've intentionally made harder for them. And it, it all works. It's all there. And you gain the costumes ephemerally, kind of like League of Legends, yeah. you know, where you'll get mm-hmm. power-ups and things. You get, And it all resets when you go back. But, you know, you use the frog suit and travel on water. Yeah. You use the gargoyle suit and travel on lava. It's it's all like, it's it's really cool. It's just, you know, it's not in this release. Yeah, so. fascinating. It's about a scope, project scope, and being able to ship. It's rather yeah. important. <laughs> but back to your question of, you know, I do get a lot of people asking, Steve, you know, we'd like something more akin to the first game in terms of just a time waster, something that is infinite. I would say to those fans, I've heard you, and there may be something coming for that, but I have nothing announced yet. Yeah, so. okay. Moving away from Trism, just more gaming in general uh, to wrap up. iPad Pros have smart keyboards, a lot of them, and I'm wondering why, why do you think developers kind of shy away from not using keyboards as a input method on iPads? I think if you have 80%, 75% using them, then you've got a business case. If you can rely on them using this a majority of the time, then you can say, we should make it for this. That's just my that's my yeah. like data scientist answer. Sorry. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's always the problem. Accessories, you can't depend on it being there. I would say pack it in. Apple, pack it in, and they'll, and they'll be there. Okay. The other question I have, other platforms. Uh, Nintendo Switch, you're, you're a Nintendo fan, you grew up with it. Yeah. Nintendo Switch has, for many indie game developers, been this new platform that they're seeing a ton of success with. Could you see yourself branching off in the future and being on Switch or Steam or other consoles? Absolutely, man. If anything, this experience tells me that I think like I said before, mobile gaming is fine. They've found the right form factor for those games for that ecosystem, right? Mm-hmm. I think this is a console game that's living on an iPhone, unfortunately. Yeah. I just I, I think I had to go through that development experience to figure that out for myself. Yeah. Do I see myself on Switch someday? Absolutely. It's great. You get that high def experience in the living room and you just take it with you like that is so cool you, and you can tell that's what they've wanted to do yeah you know with the wii u it was their prototype yeah <laughs> yeah they've had that in mind and it, it works and i'm so happy for them it's sold beautifully and people get it and they're playing these games and they take off the joy cons they play in different ways i i'm so happy that they had the success like they nintendo's kind of, kind of hit or miss like they, yeah. they have you got to hand it to them. They've, they've had a lot of innovations. Not all of them have landed. This landed beautifully, and I'm so happy for them. Yeah, likewise. Uh, it's one of my favorite consoles. The HD Rubble is one of those features that just uh, delights me every time a developer puts it to good use. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. yeah, another puzzle game came out recently. Name's escaping me, but uh, you can actually put extra controllers in your pocket or whatever, and it'll vibrate to the beat of uh, the music. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just clever stuff like that. You could have like up to eight, of these, eight of these things strapped on your body, and it's, uh, it's nice. something else. Yeah. Anything else we didn't cover about Trism or Trism 2 that you want to chat about before we wrap it up? I just want to say thank you to the fans for sticking by me and for remembering me. And I realize that even though this game might not be what you want, the fact that everyone here has been this passionate tells me that you believe in me and I hear you and I'm going to keep on making games and I appreciate you being there for me. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate both these games you've created. They're both phenomenal. And I'm excited to dig deeper in the Trism 2 and discover these mechanics that are still to be discovered, as you mentioned, uh, changing the direction of the board and all that good stuff. Get that compass, man. It's gonna yeah, good. It excited. changes the whole game. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> uh, finally, do you have any timelines on the islands? I know it's never good to ask that question about things in progress still. Well, Sapphire Island's done. It was done for a while. It's just I want to add bells and whistles to it. I want to add more side quests to it. I was almost going to release Sapphire Island with the initial download. I just didn't think it would be fair to the users to have three full islands without fetch quests. So I want to embellish on that a little bit more before I release it. Florite Island, I've got all the maps done, but I don't have the levels done. That's going to come probably a little bit after. Okay. Ruby Island, I've got all the main set pieces done. Like in the trailer, I think you see this big amphitheater kind of thing, this big volcano looking thing i've got all the set pieces for but i haven't stitched it together in a, in a cohesive like five act structure yet and then opal island that's just the end so i think that's going to come very shortly after that okay that's where i'm at yep it'll get there when it gets there like i yeah. don't think it's wise of me to put out dates i think i could do better with with dates of my fans so yeah far, polish it and make it good yeah i'm excited that's that's where it is that's where great where can people find more information about tourism 2 tourism 2.com or the app store great well, thank you so much for your time today. It's been fantastic talking with you, Steve. Hey, man. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to a special episode of iPad Pros. I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I did putting it together. Both Trism and Trism 2 are available now in the App Store, and I highly encourage you to buy both of these. Trism 2, as Steve said, is a unique console-quality puzzle game for your iPad and iPhone, and the original Trism is a gem of the 2008 App Store that feels right at home on the iPhone. Next week, as promised, is my interview with Michael of Flexibits, creators of Fantastical. As a quick reminder, if you haven't already reviewed iPad Pros on the App Store, I'd really appreciate you taking a minute right now to do just that. If you have your iPhone or iPad handy, just open up the podcast app and search for iPad Pros to leave a review. Thank you to everyone that has done so already. It means the world to me and helps others discover the podcast. Show notes are available at iPadPros.net, and you can email in your feedback to me at iPadProsPodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, and we'll be back next week for another episode of iPad Pros.